<laughs> so how many, if you just give me a quick show of hands, how many of you are in a walking club? Yep. Probably about 50, 50, and I can't tell those that are not visible. Um, okay. Um, how many of you are um, walk just with a bunch of mates generally? Yeah. Yeah. My hand is up. Yeah. No, I can, I see you there now. Yeah. Yeah. And do a lot of you walk solo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do that a good bit. Uh, I have children, so yeah, I walk solo quite a lot. It's it's <laughs> it's good. Um, yeah. So I can I can mute you all if I want to if it's getting a bit rowdy. But um, hopefully, you know, people feel free to ask questions. If it is starting to get a bit too much and we're not getting anywhere, then um, I might mute you, get something taught, and then kind of unmute you so that, you know, people can do things. I will be giving you a few bits and pieces to try and look up yourself. I expect some of you are super navigators already. Some of you may be a bit rusty because you've not been out for a bit. And some of you, it might be quite new to you. So it really doesn't matter where you're starting from. And um, if, if you're quite competent navigators, which I'd expect a good few of you may be, um, then try and consider what I'm talking about as um, how you might pass it on to someone else if you were teaching it. So it kind of, it, it'll put you in a different set of eyes again um, if, you're, if you're looking at it, how you might share this information with someone, say, in your club or someone else who wants to learn. Um, so hopefully we won't be patronizing one another and doing stuff that you're very, very familiar with already. It might just help reinforce uh, how you might teach it to someone. Okay, I think I'm going to crack on. Um, we've given them 10 minutes now to arrive. So um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mighty. Yeah. I won't mute you then. You're very well behaved. So mm -hmm. um, what I might start with is um, my agenda. I suppose what I had in mind for this was to have a look at what contours are, what features they make, um, and how kind of contours work. A lot of folk can read maps, but they maybe don't necessarily have a good grasp of how the contours are made um, to create the shapes. And then some of the features, and the biggest thing from a navigation perspective is trying to connect what you're seeing on the land with what you're seeing on the mountain. Uh, in front of you from the side or when you're standing on it, whatever perspective you're at looking at it from and also how it's shown on the map as a model or as a, uh, it's, it's not reality, it's, it's fake. So it's really to try and bring that lot together so you can visualize from the map what it's going to look like on the land and the same in reverse if you're trying to say what's that mountain over there and you know what kind of thing you're looking for on the map as well. So that'd be one key area but equally anything on the mountain leader, the mountain skills, syllabus, if you've come across those schemes, anything you like, you can ask me. Uh, if you really want to look at a compass or any of those other things you can ask, it's absolutely fine, it's your session. Um, so, but, but that's my general thing and I want to give you some tasks as well to check. I can't walk around the group and check that you're, you're finding the right features, um, but I'll do my best. You know, you can push um, bits of map up to the screen if you're really not sure. And I could also uh, put up a picture on the screen of a map. So just shout if you're not able to get, it's absolutely fine. And um, I'll try and kind of get to a point where you can. So I had some great ideas about mental visualization because we can't get onto the mountains, about picturing your favorite peak, um, standing on top of it, looking down all the sides and looking down at all the features and so forth. Um, so we'll see how we go with that. I don't know whether people have had enough of um, imagining being stuck indoors for so long. Um, and I have a couple of videos that you may or may not have seen. They're on our website uh, that we could use as a, a kind of a bit of an outdoor view as well. So just to start with, um, in terms of the contour lines, there's a very kind of textbook way of describing them that they are um, joining areas of all equal height. Uh, when someone said that to me when I was beginning, I, I was lost. It's a bit like someone talking about um, the isobars and I just was lost. So the way I kind of like to look at it is if you look at the sea around our coastline and as the sea comes in, the shape of the coastline shrinks. It gets smaller and it changes shape. So a contour line is drawing that outline of, if you pick islands, for example, 
that's your your sea level contour line, your zero. And depending on what map you're going to use, the height where they draw the next contour line, so however much you know a, a tide rises, maybe by 10 meters, they'll draw what shape they see at that height. And the same at 20 and every 10 meters as you go. So some maps have a 10 meter contour line. Most of the ones I expect you have in front of you will have 10 meters as the <laughs> interval between the sea level and the next 10 meters up. Some maps will have 20 meter contours, some 15, which make the maths real easy, not. So it's, um, it's a matter of kind of having that understanding. So I, I, um, I have something here, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you very well on, on screen, but I'll try. Um, so we'll see how it goes. So just if you can work out, I've just got a container with an apple in it. So this is my daughter's blue water. Um, and it's really just, I suppose, to put the water into the, the container and whatever that horizon line is for the water is what that contour line its shape is going to be. And I'm sorry if this is a bit kind of childlike. Um, it, it's quite hard to get a view from above on a screen. Um, but every time, wherever that water line, that tide line hits, you could draw a marker line around it and then the next one and then the next one. So mm. that when you're looking at the apple with its lines drawn on it from above, that's what you're going to see when you look straight down on your map. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, indulge me. So I have my first line quite high up in the water there. I'd take out the apple, draw the pen mark around it, and then repeat as I go up. And that, what, like that shape you're gonna get is a circle pretty much. And it's getting smaller as you get to the summit. So if, if we use the orange to do that, you're going to end up with a series of tide lines around it. So when you're looking at it from the map view from above, you're going to see a flat section of lines, circles, to show that lump. And when you're looking at it from the mountainside, when you're standing there looking at it from the side, you're obviously not going to see contour lines, but you're going to see that profile of the mountain. And when you're standing on top of it, you're going to be looking at the slope going the down in the four directions. So when I was talking about visualizing standing on top of a peak, that's the view you're going to get standing on top of it, looking down in all the sides. So it's trying to get the, um, your imagination to see the view from the top when you're on it, perhaps the view when you're walking up the side of it. So what it's going to be, it's going down behind me and up in front of me and around on either side. So you're trying to get it from different perspectives. And that's often where people get lost. Literally, they can't picture it. They, it's too many perspectives that they're trying to see through. So I think the more you can do with Play-Doh, making models of features, looking at them from above, from the side, the more you can put the feature into someone's hands, literally, the more tangible it becomes for them. Um, so from a teaching perspective, and as well for yourself, if you're trying to make that translation from one thing to another, then that's, that's another good way to do it. So I'll just put away the blue Peter. Um, so something I created a good few years ago from um, an old jigsaw, 3D jigsaw, with these contour models. <clears throat> so they're just layers of cardboard and on them you can create all the features. Are you able to see that? Yeah. 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 You can create all the features. So that if you're trying to grasp what it might look like on the map, that's, those are the contour features. It's gonna be flat, obviously, on the map. Those are gonna be the contour lines that you're gonna see. And then if you turn it in profile, 
it's really, I don't know how well you can see this guys, but you can see a rough profile of the mountain going up and down and around the lumps and bumps as you're traveling. You can also stand on some of these features and look down them uh, so that you can see on the top, it's all downhill, whatever way you're traveling. If you're on a, um, something like this, very typically coming off the top of something, you pick the nice shallow, wide way down on the spur. And you can see then that it's downhill this direction, uphill this direction, and down on either side. So it's trying to get that connection between the map view from above, what it looks like when you are standing on it, doesn't look like the map anymore, it's a different perspective, and what it might look like if you're coming up from the side and down the other side into the, the wee re-entrance shapes in here. Yeah. Is that, are people very familiar with those already? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a test, it's absolutely fine. No. Um, so it, it's really just, I think, the more you can visualize these things in a tangible manner, in your hand, literally, the easier it is for you when you're trying to get up something in the mist to visualize what you can't see. It's still there, obviously, but you can't see it anymore. So it means that you can predict with confidence what shapes, what you're going to walk over um, and what to expect. And if it's not doing that, then you know you've drifted. You think you should be going up the spur and suddenly you're, you're dropping downhill. You've probably walked off the side of it and your alarm bell will ring. No, I need to be on the, the brow of it so you can move back again. So it's predicting before you head off. So without knowing where you're at, if you have a map in front of you, some of the features that we use to get from one place to another, obviously, are gonna be the tops, the spurs, so the vocabulary, the language of the map, so have a look onto your map. Try and find somewhere with a top, with a spur that's coming down. Or up. Okay, heads are still down, so I'm not sure if you're still looking or just enjoying re looking at the map. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're all a bit guilty of that. So um, you're happy enough that you can find the summits, the tops? Yeah. 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 There, what kind of tops have you found? What Are there any symbols on the top? Anything written there? Spot height. Again? Spot height. Spot height. Yeah, you're off, that the dots with the number? Yeah. Yeah, what height is that? It's 17. Okay, so seven meters above its last contour line. Yeah. Any other types of tops people have found? Any other symbols? Small triangle. Okay, so 
the trig point. Is there anything written at that trig point to? Just, just a height. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else at the tops you found? I have a Karen height on one of mine. Okay. A Karen, sorry, just just wording. Yeah. yeah okay. It's obviously, a stone or a feature there. Is there a symbol? Is it a color or? It's just red. Uh, yeah. Just with Karen on it, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Anyone know what red symbols represent? Crosses. Huh? The crosses. Yeah. A so it. A, yeah. Go on. A cross. Okay. So on the key on the legend, um, so where all the symbols are shown on your map, um, just unfold the map out a wee bit. So there's quite a lot of colours used with the symbols anyway. Blue for water, obviously, and brown for contours and earth, if you like. Um, and black often for man-made road edges, fences, walls, tracks, those kind of things. Um, red is often is used for a few different things. So, you know, walking routes and things, but it's also used for antiquities, so old, old um, items on the map. Um, so they can sometimes be nice to look for at a glance if you're looking for something of interest as opposed to what we often do look for, which are paths, ways up or down things or into things. Um, so it's just, it's just something to be aware of, I suppose, the colours in general um, used on the map. It just, it's, it's the language, again, it's learning the vocabulary of the map. So, um, Again, I'm not sure how much you already know of this, so please ask away if, if you want more detail on any of this, just ask away and um, try not to assume too much. Okay, so everyone managed to find a top um, and what other features do you commonly navigate from and to? Reverse. Yep, yep. So they're easy enough found, any of the waterways there. They sit in one category of linear features. Um, the other, I suppose, category you could have is an area feature. So a top would be an area. Um, generally, there's something pointy on the top of it, a pile of stones or some marker that will tell you you are at the top. But often um, it's rounded and you can't really find the exact top of it because it's an area. But a river is a line feature. Um, so what other features might we use on a map to navigate around the hills on? Pathways. Say again? Pathways. Pathways, yep. So what kind of, that's another line feature. Yep. What, what have we been just talking about? What kind of features? Antiquities. Yeah, so you, you could, there could be something on the ground. Sometimes they don't exist. They, you know, standing stone may no longer be standing and may have been grown over or never been there in the first place or marked in the wrong place uh, often. Um, so yeah, they've become some of those features. Some of the man-made features, obviously roads, paths, uh, the forestry is, is quite often man-made and planted. Um, but what about the, the terrain and the land that um, those types of features? Spurs, there we go. We've woken. <laughs> Spurs, re-entrance, tops, summits we've talked about. Any other features? Saddle. Yeah. You know another name for that? Call. 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 Yep. Yep. Saddle's visual. Sounds like what it is. Doesn't really matter. There's some other features. What else might you... There's some water features as well. There's a locks or something like that, a little lake. Yep. Yeah, yep. Okay. So if I'm going to go for a walk or you're going to describe someone who's going for a walk and they set off from the car, what are they going to likely start in? A pathway. Sorry? A pathway or? Car park, probably. 
Yeah. So there's, those man-made features feeding in. What are the contours? Where are they going to start if you're going hill walking? No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> He's coming. <laughs> We're going to be in the valleys. <laughs> generally, um, you kind of start in the valley. So that is a mat. It's an epic feature. It's a huge feature generally. Um, and so it's a nice feature to start walking and then you home in on onto the peaks. They get narrower and smaller as you go up generally. So the valley is a major feature. Um, what, there's a smaller version of a valley as well called a re-entrant. It's often the word people don't, aren't familiar with. We don't tend to use it commonly unless you're navigating. So a, a good way to imagine a re-entrant um, is to think of a small valley mm -hmm. and pair it right back down to only a, a one or two contour lines or three or four contour lines, a smaller feature. What's, the, same what's the difference? What's the difference between a re-entrant and a gully? So a gully, a gully is going to be hands out of pockets. It's steep. It's the same uh, shape. That's so you the only difference. Well, you can ha you can call a, a gully a re-entrant as well. So in essence, uh, what happens in a gully? You're more likely to be climbing up the back wall of a quarry where it's very steep, there's probably loose rock around you. It's a bit of a trap. If something falls, you're kind of stuck in it. It's not somewhere that's always easy to escape from. Where a re-entrant can be quite gentle, quite shallow, could be in steeper ground, um, but it, it's not necessarily going to have rock fall or be scrambly. But in, in definition, in terms of how you would describe the shape of it, it's the same shape as a valley, the same shape as a gully, the same shape as a re-entrant. So if you're standing in any of those three features, the ground is going to, be, if you look at the four directions, it's going to be going up behind you. If you're looking down, it's going to be going down in front of you and up on either side of you. That makes sense. So that, that's the shape. It's like a seat into the ground. So one, one way to imagine that, if you're, if you have a pen and paper there, imagine a cone of an ice cream and the contour lines and the shape of those contour lines. Just, just draw me maybe three or four contour lines to describe a, a, a conical mountain. So the sugar loaf, conical mountain. Just quickly draw me a mountain with, with contours. You can put your artwork up against your camera if you wish. I feel like a proper primary school teacher. I feel like I need pe um, coloured pencils and things. There's the first one. So we've got a, an air, a bird's eye view and a side view. Okay. <laughs> this is great fun. <laughs> Left a bit, no. Oh yeah, that's it. Right a bit, no. That's it. Perfect. Marvellous. Excellent. So, breed. We can you draw a breed? Could you draw that version that you would see? How you would see that on a map? So you're looking at it from the side there, which is your profile. That's great. Um, and I missed the rest of you. Took them down too quickly, but um, <laughs> perfect. So, if if you imagine that that conical shape now with those pretty much circular contour lines. Um, and make that conical shape. Now imagine that's your ice cream cone and take your finger and do a, a kind of shifty little sweep down the side of it now to get a taste of it and redraw your contour lines to, to kind of demonstrate that scoop of ice cream you've just taken out the side just next to it. Draw another one with the scoop of ice cream gone. Marvellous. You weren't very, um, you weren't very greedy, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Need good ice cream. Oh yeah, good one, Sarah. That's a fair old chunk of ice cream. Nice. Yep. Dead on. Yep. 
Okay, so I don't know what your name is. Um, he just put that. He's got you got headphones on and a. Oh, purple. Pa uh, Patrick, uh, Jane. Patrick, 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 sorry, he's just got name Una at the moment. Patrick, right. I don't like not using names, so I'm just going to make a wee note there. So, Patrick, yeah. you've given me a view from the side, I think. M my um, art, so my art is not very good, so I was. No, no. Well, you, you don't need to be good artists. So I'll show you. Now I feel like Blue Peter. Here's one I did earlier. Um, but if you look, you see the contours there. And what, what you've drawn, Peter, is a similar version, but from the side. And now this is back to front drawing where I can't see it. So this is a real new one for me. Um, so you've drawn it from the side. So to take this drawing here, I've got the small circle at the top. And then the next slightly bigger one. Oh my God, this is so weird. Backwards and <laughs> behind where I can't see. Right, so that's me translating the one to the other view, if that makes sense, Parag. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So it's what you're seeing from above. So where the, the orange, these are very badly drawn oranges. It's tipping the view from the circle above. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's what I'm trying to get you to translate. You kind of consider it translating. So you're interpreting a map, which is a fake translation of reality, and then looking at the real thing on the land. There's no contour lines there anymore. You're looking at it from a different perspective. You've gone from the bird's eye view now to the side view. So that's why a lot of folk just cannot, they struggle. And it takes time to get that transfer accurate and to get your eye in. It comes easier to some people than others, but I think everyone can get it. It just takes time. So it will, just if it doesn't come fast at the beginning, it will do just more time looking at it. I remember chatting to an orienteer, uh, like a world-class orienteer, and he said to me, well, doesn't the map just jump out at you? Like, nope. It doesn't. But for some people, it does. They can see it all. It just stands out at them. It's just how you see things. And we don't all see things the same. So that's why it's not that clear for everybody all the time. And for other people, it's it's really obvious. So it's not you. It's just how you're looking at things. Um, but the more you do it, the more familiar it becomes and the easier it is to interpret from one to the other. So if um, a lot of folks struggle with re-entering because it's a really hard thing to draw from the side. It's a nightmare um, where everything else you can draw the top of the mountain, the dip mm -hmm. in the saddle from the side quite easily. So that's something worth doing. Make models with Play-Doh. That's quite good as well so that you can see what you're used to from the perspective that you're used to seeing it. And you can also then, same with these, you can turn around the feature so you can see it from other sides. You can look at it from uphill, down the thing, and you can also look at it from below up it um, so that you're able to visualize it from all angles. It's very typical. You get to the top of somewhere and then you turn around to come back down and it looks completely different because it, it does, because you've not looked at it from that direction before. So it, that, that's what often I think look behind you. Look behind when you're traveling so that it's not unfamiliar when you do go back down that way. It looks familiar. Um, for you. So if um, uh, do you want me to go through uh, kind of systematically then through each feature, what's, what are you going to see in each direction? Would that be useful? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm really, I'm, it's really hard to read whether you're kind of going, oh God, this is so easy or this is so hard because people are concentrating so their faces are quite static. So um, I will do that. That's fine. So if, if we're talking, we'll go from the top down, for example. So if we're talking about being on top of a peak, um, so I don't know, how easy is it for you to see this? Can you make out the top? Yeah. Yeah. I'm only looking at a small picture myself, so I can't see what you're seeing, I don't think. And you know you can look just at one person. I don't know what settings you have in your Zoom. You can get it so it's just me on the screen if you wish, or you can have it so you can see everybody. Um, I think Speak it's... View, isn't it? Speak of you, um, yeah, so that's just whoever's talking at the moment. Um, 
and yeah. you can have gallery view. So if you want to, because I'll be doing most of the talking, unfortunately, <laughs> but it might just give you a bigger picture. So if you click, it's top right, it clicks between speaker and gallery. So that might just help your visual of this a bit. Um, so if we're, if we're standing, you can all, you know what the top of a mountain looks like. You've all been on plenty of them, I'm sure. In each of the four directions, that's what we're going to do to every feature now that we're going to go through. So on the top, every direction, front, back, left and right is down. Okay, so that, that's our starting point. So being able to do that for whatever feature you're on can help you determine the feature you're standing on when you think I'm just on a slope. There's nothing definitive here. There's nothing I can locate myself on. But it, anywhere where you're on a mountain, it's going to do something in all four directions. And by definition, that'll tell you what you're standing on. So it can be very helpful, and particularly in bad weather when you can't see too far. So your, your perception of things is a bit thrown. And um, things maybe look nearer or farer, or sometimes you can't even tell if it's quite up or down sometimes because it's misty, if you've come across that. So if you pick, I'm gonna pick the next feature, a spur. So a spur, if you think of it on your own body, it's like a shoulder of land going downhill from the tops. It's often the route hill walkers choose when they're making their route because it's an easier way up than some of the steeper slopes where, you know, up the back here might be quite steep but the contour is quite close together. People often pick the nice route up the spur. It gives you a good view as well on either side. You can, you can see around you. Um, so, and in terms of features, it's a line feature following along it. It's quite a big area as well but it's linear. If you wander off to the side, you'll start going downhill, you'll fall off it. So it's a good thing to navigate by. So if you're standing on a spur, say we've gone from the summit and I'm walking downhill, in front of me is down, behind me was up, is up, and on either side it drops. So that's your <coughs> directions, that's your definition of a spur, down on three and up on one. Yeah. If we then move into very well, you can see this, this re-entrant shape. So again, walking down from the top and I'm dropping into this, almost like a seat. So behind me again is uphill, in front of me is downhill, but this time the walls are rising on either side of me. So I've got three up and one down. The opposite, if you like, of a spur where it's three down and one up, okay? You could, in theory, take your spur, turn it upside down and sit it into your re-entrant. That's not too wacky. Um, so th that's the kind of shape that you're looking for. And to kind of add, again, if you're trying to teach someone about re-entrance, to give them this notion of what the word actually means, going back to our conical uh, contour lines, the circles, where nothing really is affecting those contour lines. So the slope isn't being interrupted at all. We take our scoop out of it. So let's say this is our ice cream scoop. And rather than the contour line just being the natural line of the slope now, the contour line has to re-enter the slope. It's to go into it and come back out again. So that's another, it's kind of a visual way. It's literally driving into the slope and then driving back out of it. So when you're trying to get a grasp of what the feature is, or you're trying to teach someone what that feature is, maybe bring them and walk them into it and back out of it. Walk them from below and up it, walk them from the top and down and drop into it so it encases them on either side. And it will just, it will give them different perspectives. Go on, someone was gonna, you wanna ask something there? Nope. Okay, and hello to those um, two or three more people that joined us. Um, if you are looking for your video and you're unmute, it's bottom left on the screen. Otherwise, I'll assume you just want to stay quiet and out of sight, and that's fine. Um, maybe your signal. So that's the, the re-entrant, the spur. So I'm just going to grab a different model um, for a saddle or a cull. So from the side, maybe quite hard because they're not that steep, up down, up, down. If I'm coming at it from this side, I'd walk up 
to the high point and then drop down the far side. So from the map view, two tops and a gap in the middle. So if you can picture a Pringle or the saddle of a horse, <coughs> that's the shape you're looking at with a re-entrant. So it's going to be down on two sides and up on two sides. Uh, Jane is a saddle and a call the same thing? Yeah, yeah. I think um, call is a French word and often people will go down to the call. It might be quite a narrow feature, um, but it's the same in terms of the shape. A saddle suggests a softer, broader seat of a gap between two mountains, where a call, it, it, it sounds, it seems to describe something a bit narrower and tighter, but it's the same. We used some, there are some features where we might have five different names for the same thing, depending on whether you're Welsh, Scottish, Irish, English, or French, or, or whatever. So, but yeah, they're kind of interchangeable. Some people prefer the saddle because it's descriptive and visual. Some like cull, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. As long as you know when the person you're describing it to knows what you're talking about, the language of it, and it, it's fine. So when you're describing the, the cull, it's an area. So often when people are beginning to navigate, they say we'll go to the top and then we're going to navigate to the cull. And it can be quite difficult to locate yourself in a big area. So you may decide, I'm going to the far side of the cull where it starts to climb again. And that's a def at least that's a point of change. Whereas if you say I'm going to the center of a cull, this one's quite well defined, it's narrow. But some culls might be three or four, 500 meters across and pretty flat. So you could be anywhere. So if you're trying to use that center to get to find the spur, for example, you're not going to. But on this, it's quite well defined. So you might be happy you go into that little niche and then find your spur from it. So um, if you're standing in the saddle, then depending on what way you're facing, two downhill and two uphill to define it by definition. Okay, what other features have we got left? Um, so a ridge, I'm going to pick a different one. No one mentioned ridge actually. What's the difference? What is a ridge? Anyone? Very steep and on two sides, mm -hmm. narrow on the top. Yep. Anything else? Steep, steep on two sides, narrow on the top. Someone else, what happens to the other two sides? Very high again. Okay, are they up or down? Up. Or flat or? Up. Up on yeah. both. So we've got two downhill sides. Yeah. Are they going up in front of them and up behind them? Front, front and back. Front and back. So what feature have you just described there? Someone else. Two down and two up. Saddle. The saddle. saddle. Okay, but well, you're not wrong either. <laughs> um, so if, um, has anyone else got a description of a ridge? Because it's used it's in a couple of ways. Two spot points. Who's that? Sorry. Is it a saddle between um, two spot heights? It is. Yeah, saddle is between two spot heights. So um, Parig there described two uphill, an up on either side and a down on either side, which is a ridge. But it is actually a saddle that he described. You're right. Um, so often people call spurs ridges. Anyone come across that? I'm going to go up the ridge or down the ridge. No. No. It's, I, I find a lot of folk in, in training courses and so forth, they, they describe it. We're going up this ridge and then we're going to go along to the summit and, and so forth. So don't be too thrown. Like a ridge, if you think you're a ridge back, it's the backbone of something. And typically it's going to dip down into small saddles over little tops and so on. If you go on a ridge walk, depending on where you live, the Glendalock, you know, around the Glendalock horseshoe is a ridge walk. You walk up something and then you're on the tops and you dip along the tops. That's the ridge. Okay. Nice to think of really narrow ones, uh, but they're not always. They can be quite wide. So if you can see there's three tops here. So once you've climbed the height, the ridge walk will be along the tops. You're not losing a lot of height. You're not going down to the valley and... Um, you're, you're kind of, you're moving along. Sorry, I just have a visitor here. Yes, 
sorry. Um, <laughs> life goes on at home. Um, <laughs> so it was an easy question. That's good. I got it right. Um, so, so the ridge walk in general terms is going to include tops and saddles and little spurs as you come off the top down into the saddle is a little spur, you climb up another little spur and so on. But in general, the, the major feature of it is down on either side and pretty much flattish as you go along the top. You're not going down to sea level and back up again. So you weren't wrong, Parg, or uh, I don't know what your name is, who's with Sarah, um, but you, <laughs> you, you weren't wrong either. You were describing the correct features. And that's what I'm saying. So if you're actually standing on a point and describe front, back, left and right, to tell you what you're standing on and give you a definition. So even when it's not that clear and there's, it's rugged and there's little nulls and dips and bumps and so on, in general, it's going down or up, and that'll give you a description of your feature. We'll clarify it for you. Um, what are the um, features? So the ridge, re-entrant, valley. The valley, are you happy enough with the valley? Yeah. 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 What happens on four sides? What's the, what does it do on the four sides? I can't hear anyone speak. It's okay. It goes, so it goes up on. Depends which way you're looking. Go on, sorry. Horizontal contours. Like her, her, yeah, so it's going to be the. Alongside the rear. Yeah, so the, the contour line is going to be. Um, let me draw one. It's really hard, isn't it, to be able, without being able to show, a, show something to you. Find a valley on your map. So, okay, so if you look at the bottom section there, there's a bit of blue black on my, on my screen here. The valley is, is going to be, well, you don't know which way up is it, do you? You know, so if you imagine that's the low point in the middle and these are going up, up the back of the valley. So if you're in Dublin, Wicklow area, you know Glendalough. So this is walking into Glendalough and you've got the steep sides and then the shallow valley bottom, glaciated U-shaped valley um, with a river in it, of course, to confuse matters. So is it a river valley or a, a glacier, a U-shaped valley? Anyway, um, so you can imagine the walls of the valley all around you. So they're going up on three sides and down on one. That's your definition. The same as your re-entrant, just on a much bigger scale. Um, what are the features? Any other features, land features that you're, you mm -hmm. use to navigate by that we've not yet mentioned? Have a sip of your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Or whatever's keeping you awake this time of the day. <laughs> Frags. Okay, so are you able to find those features now that we've been talking about um, on your map? So you've you found a summit. You found, I think, um, saddles. If anyone's not, just say so. That's why you're here. It's not like, just just say, and I can try and put one up on the screen and show you. <clears throat> you're happy enough with what a, a saddle or call looks like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You can find examples on the map. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and a... A valley, you're all happy to find one of those on the map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A re-entrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of nodding going on, that's good. Yeah. Um, a saddle or a call, we've, we've done a spur. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Sabine, are you trying to say something there? No, sorry, no. Oh, I'm okay. 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 What you haven't done is an all. No, that good. Yeah. So, uh, 
you come across knolls before? No. Yeah. The very famous one, <laughs> the grassy one. <laughs> where the shooter <laughs> was allegedly um, so it's a mound, a small mound so it's going to have a similar shape to a summit so we didn't describe the, the name of that final contour line on a summit um, which can be called a ring contour it's, it's complete so on a map if you have a look, usually if you have a look at a summit, find a summit on your map and have a look for a very small circle of a contour line, a tiny, tiny-ish one. They're not as common, but they are there. So have a route around and see if you can find just a tiny little ring of a contour. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more looking for. Okay, so I'm just going to put a, a picture because you may not find one on your map, I'm not sure, but I don't doubt you know what I'm yeah. describing. So I've just drawn it in black. So here there's a, a ring, can you see that? Yes. yes. So there's the, the top and the, the spur coming down and here there's a little ring contour. So if I'm walking down here in the mist, I expect to see a little mound. It's a 10 meter higher than the previous contour line. So it should be pretty distinctive. It should be there because it's the contour lines are drawn if the land rises 10 meters above the previous one. If it doesn't, there may be lots of little lumps and bumps that are not shown that you might think should be. Um, but because, you know, this is the, the contour lines, and so if the null is sitting between it, it won't be shown, it'll be missed, and it might be nine metres high, and quite big, but because it's not hitting where that line is, then it won't be shown. So bringing that back to where I was pouring the water very unsuccessfully on the apple, the contour line is at a fixed height, so you can't just put them where the land is interesting. So if that 10 metre contour line misses a really interesting feature in the gap, it may not be shown and might be missed. Something quite significant might be missed. On the tops, all of the summits with the spot heights on them, they've bothered to show that it's a bit higher than that previous contour line, where I think it was Parag who said, you know, it was 807 meters for the top of the mountain. It didn't quite reach the next contour, but it was worth showing that it went on a bit more than the previous contour line. So some, that's where sometimes people feel the map isn't really what they would imagine it to look like on the ground. And that can throw people as well, because it might, as particularly with lumps like that, um, I'm trying to think, I don't know whether you're all Dublin or Wicklow based, but my apologies if I'm using examples from there, but you would have these in Kerry, Galway and, and wherever else as well. But on the tops of, um, let me think, if, you, if you're familiar with Bray, the Bray group of, of mountains, Bray Head, um, where's my map? And I can remember the names, but that section is all very knobbly in its character. If you think of the Burren with its stepped character, with the limestone pavements. So you get different characteristics within the rock type, giving you a different shape um, <laughs> in the landscape. So if you were in somewhere like Bray Head um, or in the Mourns, again, I don't know if anyone's from up in the Mourn area with all the tours on the summits, you've got lots of lumps and bumps that will give rise to lots of little ring contours. Kerry would be very complex terrain that way as well. So you get lots of contour lines, which for some people, they think it makes the map reading more difficult, but in fact, you've got more information. So you've got more features to navigate by. So it's actually a benefit. Um, so you'll know in Wicklow, the mountains are quite rounded and smooth. And in Kerry, they'd be quite rugged. In Connemara, they'd be quite rugged. So lots going on, lots of flat plateaus in Connemara where you've got steep spurs that you might need to use your hands to get up. So it's that characteristics of the terrain that make it so interesting to travel around country and in Ireland we've got such a variety so I'm seeing no uh, yep very good very good I can see that thank you um, so 
Hopefully now everyone's had a bit of a chance to find that feature. Anyone still not located one? No. You're all good? Did someone say they've not? So. Nope. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, so in Converse, if you look on your key, um, the legend or key, where it's describing the contour lines. Let's see where they are. Okay, so for some of you, depending on what map you have, some of you might show that the contours get different colors as you go up. So the shading might get a bit darker um, from the, the green in the valley to the pale, um, I suppose it's kind of a pale brownie type color, orangey-ish. Um, and as you go up the heights, then the shading gets darker into kind of earthy, more earthy colors. You'll also notice that they have shown a slightly darker contour line every 50 meters. And that, that's your index contour. If you're trying to look through a lot of contour lines to work out how much climbing you're doing, there was no reference point by putting those 50 meter contour lines. It'd be quite hard to try and count each contour line one by one. So the, you can kind of say five, 10, and then count the, the extra ones on either end. So you can work out how many meters you're going to climb on this next section that you're going to walk up. That's called an index contour. Um, <clears throat> can anyone find a feature called a, um, a depression? Has there anyone got a symbol for depression on their map? <laughs> I can't mention that word at the moment, can you? Um, <laughs> Say again. The depression would be a null turned upside down the other way, is it? Yep, I'm liking your thinking. Yep, it is. So normally, I can't see one on here, and I don't often see them on the map. Um, but what, what, when I drew that picture, that very bad picture of the valley, and I was saying it's really hard to know whether it's uphill or downhill. Um, they will write numbers on the contour lines. So again, pick out the map and have a look around it and you'll see that in certain places on the map, they'll have the numbers in 50 meter intervals telling you 250, 300, 350, 400. So from those areas, you can tell that they're climbing up, the numbers are going up and it's going uphill. So the rivers usually sit in the lowland as well. So that can be a good indicator of up and down. And the tops, I know I feel like I'm passionizing, but the tops are on top, but sometimes you get mounds in the valley as well. But, but those kind of general indicators, sometimes you can get your eyes for some reason when you're reading a map, you just start not to know whether it's up or down. There's no reference points. There's no numbers marked or something just for a bit of area and um, you're suddenly inverting the land and trying to look for a hill when it's actually going downhill and so on. But often, you might see a railway code and some often, rather than this ring contour that's going to be popping out of the land, you may get this, this symbol here with the dashed line on either side that's supposed to tell that it's going into, it's a dip into the land. Uh, they're not that common. They don't generally bother to mark them on the bigger maps. It's more orienteers that would be interested in that fine detail. Um, but just that you know that they're there. Um, and other other kind of go on, sorry. No, I think someone's just moving around. Um, other interesting things that can expand your awareness of map reading and uh, kind of add to the interest of reading maps is to use different maps. So I've got a, a map here that shine from the window because it's laminated. It's, it's designed more like typically like a, an orienteering map where orienteers, they really need to know about the terrain underfoot. Can I travel through that ground? Is it a, a deep forest or is it open and I can run through it? That kind of thing. They generally are on a bigger scale because um, they need more detail. So they need more space on the map to show that extra detail. This map here is of Glendalough and it's a 1 to 25,000. 
Uh, hands up. Uh, how many of you use in one to 50,000? Most of you. Any of you use in one to 25? I have two of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, one, one. For the, one for the Reeks and one for Brandon. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. Like the, the Ordnance Survey now has started to do the one to 25 of the main mountain yeah. areas. And it takes a bit of getting used to the change. Go on. One and 30. Yeah, there's one to 30 as well. So that'll be, um, that's East, Coast. Yeah, yeah. East Coast maps. They're brilliant maps as well. Uh, yeah. A tricky scale in some ways, but they are very good maps. The, the, the information on them is superb, really good. And what's the contour interval on that one? It is... So all of you on one to 50, just to give you all the same task, have a look on your maps and find out what interval your contours are lined out at. So are they, how often are they drawing contour lines? 10 metres. Yeah. It's a good thing to find where it is on the map because you, more and more now, you'll be given the options of different scale maps. So it's good to know it's not always going to be 10. Uh, it often is, but it's not always. Mm -hmm. And it's good to know where to find that on a new map. What, why do you say that map is, that contour line is difficult? I don't think it's difficult, but it, it's tricky. And the reason why on your, um, on the scale of it, so if you consider that a box on a map is one kilometer, so this is a one to 25,000, and that each box is one kilometer by a kilometer, roughly one and a quarter on the diagonal, one and a half. When you've got a 1 to 50 map, one kilometre is easily, it's easy to break down into 10. If you've got a 1 to 30, you're trying to break it down okay. into, it's not decimal anymore, even though it's a number of 10, it's not decimal breakdown anymore and it becomes, it can become tricky. It doesn't have to be though. Um, so when people are trying to work around scales, a very simple, I would go with the millimeters on your compass to start with, always. You're familiar with them for a start. So if you're teaching someone about this, um, on your, your compass, hang on. So you've got, you've got your ruler down the side. So if you're using a one to 50, one millimeter represents 50 meters. And the same, if you're using a one to 25, one millimeter is 25 meters. If it's one to 30, it's 30 meters. If it's one to 40, it's 40 meters. So that to me is the fastest way to give people access to measuring any scale maps like instantly and not to be scared of changing a map because oh, I'll have to learn how to measure it now again. So start when you're learning, I think, or teaching someone with the millimeters to measure a distance. They do have nice uh, Roma here, so you can pick the scale you're working on. One to 50, one to 25 is on the outer edge and so on. And that will break it down for you. But I would still stand by using the millimeters because you can transfer it to any scale. So for a one to 30, you've got your 30 meters. So 10, 10 mm -hmm. millimeters in your box, each millimeter is 30 meters. So it just, it just becomes a little less simple to add up multiples of 30. Mm -hmm. um, snuck in an extra topic there, guys. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's such like such good variety of maps now. The one to, I don't know if any of you use the Harveys. I'm trying not to brand anything, but it's just that they have a one to 30 and they use 15 metre contour lines, which are again, just awkward to add up in multiples of 15. Um, but these maps, they have an excellent way of showing terrain without laying on too many symbols that cover up the contour lines. So, in Ireland on our 1 to 50 and I'm conscious now it's um, 5 past 8 so um, I don't know how long you've been told this is going on for but um, 
three hours. <laughs> and I think an hour and a half is what it was sold on. So um, yeah, I could keep hour, going yeah. forever. Yeah. Um, so um, on um, where was I going with this now? And the scales. Um, I managed to distract myself entirely yeah. there. The intervals between contours on the Harvey maps every 15 yeah. meters. Yeah. Okay, so in in the way on I don't know if you can see this, I'll try and put it in as close as I can and try and keep my hands still. Okay, so you can see the brown, the contour lines, the background is pale, and so the contour lines are quite easy to see. I'm just gonna try and find a slightly um, interfered with map. Okay, yeah, there we go. So if you see here where they're trying to show the trees, I'm just going to tip it on its side and get it in. Um, just want to be outside and in front of the people. Well, there you go. Um, okay, so you see the trees there. They're quite sparse, but they're starting to cover up contour lines and hide the terrain that you're trying to see. And if we go to another area where it's more densely forested, you can see that. It starts to conceal the detail. And there you've got a section where you've got tracks, forestry, lots of stuff going on. And the contour lines start to disappear out of your perception. You, you kind of stop seeing them and start getting distracted by the path or the forest edge or the boundary lines that have been drawn there. So contours are king. They're absolutely the thing for navigating with. And anything on a map that conceals them, I think makes it harder to do that. It's in our instinct to like man-made features because you know they must be right. And you feel confident when you've got to the road or the, the, the forest corner because it's a very obvious land you, feature, you think. But it should be just as obvious when you get to a, a major summit or a saddle that you've reached where you were looking for. But the man-made features we tend to naturally gravitate towards because we feel more secure that it's right. Um, so with Harvey's, knowing what's under your feet can be really useful. So map makers in the UK on the same one to, one to 50 maps are in the north of Ireland have started to draw cliff symbols and crags which can cover up the, the contour lines underneath. So I'm just going to, I've got a big bag of maps here, just bear with me a sec. Okay, so <clears throat> I've got a map of Northern Ireland, one to 50. So have a look at what happens to the shading as you go up. Can you see that? Um, I'll just pick somewhere where it's a little steeper. Can you still see the contour lines? See the big black line there? Mm -hmm. With the kind of eyelashes. There's quite a lot of them because there's crags. Those are some crag symbols. I describe them as eyelashes. So there's a solid black line and then the little lashes coming off them. So if you've got an area that's got lots of crags, it's going to start to conceal the contour lines underneath. But if you compare that to a steep section of ground on our maps, again, I'm not sure how well you can see this. Can you see the steep ground? Yeah. It becomes a kind of shadow. So in theory, you wouldn't know if it's a cliff or just very steep ground with, with grass on it. So they started to draw in those, those eyelash symbols to try and make it obvious that it's a cliff. But by doing that, you hide the contour lines underneath. So for Harvey's maps, they've been super smart and they do a bit of both. And you've got the eyelashes there 
but you can see they've actually just changed the color of the contour line to gray where it's been orange and that's telling you that there's um, scree slope without concealing the contour lines they just changed the color of it so I, I think that's really smart and then they've drawn crag symbols and the scree slopes you can see underneath become quite visual you getting that yeah. Yeah. so if you were trying to walk from that lake up that slope there with all those crag symbols you can see individual gullies between the black lines where you might be able to push a path up and you could see you might need a rope on some of those gullies because this is quite steep those contour lines are very close mm. together yeah so if you had the same area just with contours and no crag symbols you may think i can get up that but the crags you know it's going to be steep and you may choose to come around i can't even get into it um to come around and use the spur instead and avoid this very steep ground unless you've got a rope or something maybe to go through so knowing what the terrain is doing is really useful if you're trying to get up different ways so it's definitely worth trying different um types of maps the, the, the harvey's maps i don't like as much because they're a one to 30 the 15 meter contour intervals so if you're only drawing a contour or a line every 15 meters you're going to miss a lot more in the gap because the gap is bigger but if you're walking tracks and trails and you want to know what's underfoot, they're superb for that as well. So it depends what you're doing with them, really. Um, but it's just, it's good to know that there, there's differences. So if you do go walking up north or in the UK or down south, if you're normally based in the, up north, then it's going to look different. Typically up north, people are working on 1 to 25, same in the, in the rest of the UK as well, because that's what they have them. Um, when I moved across from using maps in the UK to here, everyone was on one to 50 maps. And I found it quite um, frustrating at the beginning, but I actually prefer them now. They're more in proportion. Um, the one to 25 spread and shallow things. So I, I kind of like the one to 50s now and there's enough detail to walk easily on them. Okay, so it's a quarter past eight. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking always. Um, <laughs> Well, if, if there are any questions, um, I'm Sorry, just... Jill. Yeah. I have one question there um, about the interval lines. Is it actually written anywhere on the legend? Or yeah. I know I can, you can see it on the map itself, but I was just looking as you were speaking there and I can't see it written on the legend itself. Yeah, just give me a second now. What map are you using? I am using the uh, 1 to 50,000. Okay. OSI maps. Okay, I'll just have a see where it's written. Some maps will have them written on the front cover. Some will have them written in the legend. Um, I, do, I do know you can look at and count the interval lines, but I'm just wondering, as you were saying, is it actually yeah. written down anywhere? Yeah, so see, see on the bottom of your map. Now, this is quite an old map. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's laminated. Um, on the bottom of the legend, it says antiquities, relief, water features. Antiquities, relief, water features. The big red headings. Yeah. Not, a, not on the, the a mine is a 2009, so I don't know. Um, Along the bottom of the legend, on this one anyway, it's got all the water features would be in one section. To the left of that, it's got relief. I'd be surprised if it's much different. Can I just see it maybe just showed up oh, to yeah, the camera sorry, if you yeah, don't yeah. mind? Yeah. No one has to tell, sorry. Uh, no, my one is not coming in like that at yeah. all. I don't have it either. Let, let me get a newer map, one sec. Okay. 
change so yeah they've changed them a bit again um but it's still on, it's still coming in in the same place so um if in this one here where it says legend at the bottom yes I'm, Sorry, going to I'm just after finding it, Jess. Go it's across. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's just move across. They just removed the big headings in red. That's yes. all. That's a safe space, I'd say. It's it's quite interesting. We worked quite a lot with Ordnance Survey in the last couple of years in the well, they've been designing the one to twenty fives and it's really like maps are such an interesting political and all kinds of um, things come into play as to what's shown and for navigators we just want to know how you to see the, yes no sorry you see the, the blue cross there uh, Grata, uh graticule intersection you often see it on maps is this the latitude longitude crossing point could be i'm not sure could be yeah <laughs> Okay, let me just track that down on here. I think that's the one that you're talking about. So if you look on the side of your maps where you've got your, you know, the, the grid references. Yeah. Every so often on the very outer edge of your map, it'll have the latitude lines. And longitude will be marked across the bottom. You see those? Yeah. So right on the very edge of the map, um, I'll just show where I mean. So that in black, yeah. it'll have those marked. And if two cross on the map, you'll end up with a blue cross. And that's the one that they, I think that you're referring to. There's the intersection. I'm trying to find one on this. Um... Yeah, you're right, yeah, I see them there, yeah. Yep. Okay. So they're not something that you'd necessarily use for navigation um, or ever maybe come across at all ever, potentially. It's there on the legend. It's it's definitely worth having a look. Um, you know, every time you go out or again, if you're teaching someone to get the, the key, give them the kind of fundamental blue for water and kind of brown for land and black for man-made. And then each time you go out, pick a few more symbols and build up your repertoire. Uh, understanding of what they are um, but it's, it's just a quick way for people to quickly grab the vocabulary um, when they pick up a map so do we have any other questions it's been a long week eh <laughs> it is friday night i was surprised actually when the friday night was the night <laughs> picked <laughs> Every day is the same at the moment. <laughs> yeah. What have, people, what have people been doing with the, you know, the 2K and now 5K? Isn't that, don't you interpret that as a, within a 5K radius, not a 5K linear measurement or 2K as it was? Well, in some, in some ways anyway. it's the same thing, isn't it? Because if you do a line from where you are to five kilometers and then do a radius, it's always linear getting out to that radius wherever you are. Yeah, but within the 5K, you can walk 15 or 20K. Oh, yeah, you can go in circles. You yeah. can do, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I suppose it's it's to try and keep people to their locality because people live reasonably spread out in rural areas and then to try and stop people crossing paths. So so I think it's, I think it's, a radius, it's, it's, a, it's the radius. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's just got a bit wider. I missed that briefing. Well, two K is that. extended to five K. That's the bottom line. Over no, I don't. I don't think that's for another two weeks. From Tuesday next. No, another two weeks of the of the way it is, and then it's going to be extended. No, no, it's extended. For, it's extended from Tuesday, and over seventies can go, can go out. Yeah. Oh, is it? Once a day yeah. from from next Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, I've I've not heard the briefing yet, so I'm just. Yeah. I had an inkling it was coming. We had a bit of a heads up that it might be, but I don't know yeah. when. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, I'm trying to think, what else did I say I would talk with you about? Mm. Am I missing any? The difference in grid north and magnetic north? 
I didn't say I was going to talk about that, but I can do. Um, so um, grid is your map, the, the, the one that we, the, the classroom north, if you like. And magnetic north is the earth, the one that um, affects your compass needle. So the two are different because obviously the earth is not square, um, but curved in very simple terms. Um, so that's one way of looking at it because your map should, uh, the earth tapers, but your maps don't, they're square. Okay, so grid north is your grid, your map grid, and magnetic north will, will pull that needle to it. Magnetic north is moving inconsistently, constantly. There you go. <laughs> so when, when you're measuring on your map from A to B, <clears throat> either by I and saying, oh, it's roughly east 90 degrees or it's, it's west 270 um, on the map, is square but on the land is a little bit different depending on where you are so you have to make a slight adjustment for that so very simply you can set your map um, with the land the river is in front of me the mountains behind me so you can line the map up with those two features and i want to go to the peak over to my left so i set my map with my features and then i walk off to the left if I'm trying to do that in mist or it's a small feature, it's something I can't see very easily, I might choose to measure that angle accurately with my protractor, my compass, so that I know exactly how far from north it is. So if I'm going east, it's exactly 93 degrees, not 90 or whatever it might be. Because over a distance, that little bit of difference will make a difference and end up slightly somewhere else, um, which could put you off the edge of your, your track or off a cliff or in the lake or whatever depending on how long the leg is so when you're taking the bearing from the grid you'll get your grid bearing and when you want then to walk on the land with it you need to make that adjustment to marry it up with compass needle that is telling you where north is on the land okay not quiet again it's so frustrating that I can't see you properly. It is so frustrating as a teacher. Is that making sense for folk? Yeah. Yeah. So again, I don't know if, if you're all very familiar with compasses in north, south, east and west, but definitely um, top of map is, is, you know, to know and understand that you can do guesstimate bearings without a compass. I've had a few folk on assessments for leadership that, could take a bearing, walk on a bearing. They didn't know what it meant when they got 30 degrees. They had no idea that it was 30 degrees from north. They just did it and got there, but they had no comprehension. Top of the map is zero north. Bottom of the map south is 180. It's the, the principles, I suppose. So all you're doing is measuring from north around to east, around to south and, and so forth up the way. Am I doing this backwards? I think I can't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure whether you're seeing a flip of me or the same. Um, so but going from zero down to 90 and so on. So that's all your compass is doing is measuring that angle from north. Uh, and then you're, you've got your measurement off your grid and then you line that up with the magnetic and you can walk then where you want to go. Are we full for now? Are we good? Yeah, it was excellent. <laughs> I think, Anya, we could have doubled up here. It would have been absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for your information, um, it's not a sales pitch, but it's just to let you know where information is. Um, if I'm assuming you're all members, but you maybe aren't. Um, you don't have to. Um, run and join up but on the website there's quite a lot of information um, I didn't show you any of the videos but there are skills videos on features there are um, skills videos on self-location relocation and um, walking on where, where are they, Jen? say again on the, on the website is it yes so on our I can hang on if I can very quick let me see where share screen just just where is this uh, I'm just going to try and share a screen with you very quickly. So this is just, if you, I hope you can see this now onto our website. 
So if you if you come into the home page and then into training and just in on the side here, so there's a number of training downloads and there's a tab for skills videos. And then there's about six, seven, maybe eight of them. Some on climbing and rope work. Movement for walkers, not often taught, uh, but not everyone's a natural mover. Bit of um, mountain leader rope work, belaying and climbing, taking bearings, distance, timing, pacing, map setting, and some access and conservation. They're really good videos um, around the mountains, self-location. And this one here is the one I'd probably recommend given what we've been talking about today, the saddle features and so on, because you can see, and it's a great presenter, sounds very like me, looks very like me, um, is me. Um, so you'll hear a lot of the same <laughs> language that I use when I'm teaching anyway, but you can see it on the hill a bit more. So that would be a good, it's only about three minutes long. They're all about, that's appar apparently that's how long people could tolerate, but we know that's different now because you've been in here for nearly two hours. So, um, so yeah, have a look at that one. Um, it will ref it will kind of go over. Oops, didn't mean to press it. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> and they have this awful cheesy music in the background. So not my fault, but um, yeah. So that that would be a good uh, reinforcement of, of a good bit of what we've covered. And there's a couple others there. That one's an excellent one as well. The farmers talking about people on their land and and how they feel about it. It's really um, positive, mm -hmm. and. Um, Quite interesting to, to see it from from their perspective sharing their mm -hmm. livelihoods with you so um how do i get back to you okay no no yeah i'm kind of newish to zoom but um, i've lost the big gallery view for some reason go can you see share. me okay anyway? go back to share screen oh thank you yeah, if I can find that. No, can't find that either. Oh, there we go. Stop share. There it is. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so those would be some aspects there. There are also some presentations in the website as well that would be more kind of PowerPoint type thing um, if you're feeling that way inclined. But, you, if, you know, if you're in a club, you can share those bits and pieces. A couple of other bits. I see you holding up the Walk Safely leaflet. Uh, do you have any of those? Uh, we do. Yeah. And we're just working on a newer version and updates. It's been a long time due. Um, so I know that's in the, the making now. We have an access, uh, uh, sorry, a hill walking um, committee uh, relatively recently um, introduced and they're working on developing an updated version of that. There are some still, but they're in the office at the moment and everyone is working remotely. So um, I don't think we'll be able to post any out to you, but I think there are copies of them on the website. You can print off, um, or send PDFs off to people. Um, there's a few other bits, again, um, the walking awards pathway. So obviously you guys are interested in, in training and um, for, for yourselves, there's the climbing awards as well. So the stuff that we've been covering today would all be part of the likes of mountain skills, if you've not come across that, which is personal proficiency um, in navigation and how to negotiate route find, um, hazard management, weather, those kinds of things that you would need, what to carry, that kind of stuff. Um, so they're there, we've 90 odd trainers across the country and they advertise the courses when they're allowed on the mountains. Um, so those would be good kind of stepping stones if you're planning to get some more formal training. Um, and they're dotted all around the country as well. So you don't need to travel too far, maybe within your 10, five, five, whatever distance we're allowed to do when we're actually allowed to, to communicate with people again in a bit more close proximity. The other thing is we are, um, these sessions are free. I know Anya who has set them up has, has said that we can donate. There's a couple of places that we can donate to um, the, the Mountain Rescue at the moment. Um, obviously they can't go out and fundraise. So they're particularly strapped at the moment. Like I do sit on their exec board, I'll have to confess, I'm not out to try and get money for them, but um, they can't fundraise, which is like a good 50% of what they do is fundraising to keep themselves going. So if you do feel inclined to donate or ask other people to, great, um, stick a few euro in their direction. And um, we're also, what's the other one, Anya? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you. Uh, yes. So that, that's another option as well uh, it's Mountaineering Islands Environmental Defence Fund so it goes not to that directly to us to kind of pay our staff it's um it's to work on specific projects so um mm -hmm. if you feel inclined but no obligation obviously and there's other useful leaflets as well to kind of get more information about where you're going obviously the more you know about it the more fun and involvement um you're going to have if you're engaged with what you're walking on and in um, Right, I'm going to stop because I'm conscious it's late, you're tired, and um, I can keep going, so I'll stop. If you have any questions, you know my email address, um, jane at mountaineering.ie. 